So today we're going to continue in the book of James. I'm excited to walk you through something that I've titled, Break It Off. Break It Off. We'll be looking at James. The actual text is verses 1 through 8. And we're going to dive into this rather quickly because we still have communion that we're going to share in this morning. And I don't want to keep you too long. But starting in verse 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't you know that they come from the battle or from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasure. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity, another word is hatred, towards God? Therefore, if anyone chooses to be a friend of the world, they become an enemy of God. Or do you not think that Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell within us? But he gives us more grace. Say more grace. more grace. All right, more grace. And this is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but gives strength to the humble. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What do we need to know from that? Well, first off, you need to know that James was not writing heathen people. He was not writing a particular community that was known for just being bad. James was actually writing the church. And it's interesting in his writings of the church, he wasn't writing a particular community there either. What James was writing was a direct result, or whom James was writing, was a direct result of what we call in the Greek the diaspora. We get the English word dispersed, okay? What was occurring is James was writing during a time where there was great persecution that was happening. And in times of great persecution, you'll have some people, they'll just bear down. They're like, we can hold on. But you'll have some people who are also going, we're out of here. We're done. We're leaving. And so what you had is you had the church leaving all of these major hot spots of persecution. It's funny how they left. God used crises... God used pain to take his message, which, let's be honest with it. Let's be honest. Who really loves change? Not too many people do. Who really says, hey, you know what? The absolute best thing in my life would be for everything I own to be toppled down by a tornado so I can start all over again. Leslie? No? Okay. Nobody would do that. Think about how you've grown up in a particular community. When I came to Robinson, I've shared with you, this is my 28th church in my lifetime. I have no idea what Roots is in the way that some of you know Roots. Some of you who've grown up in Flat Rock, raised a family in Robinson, have been here since Jesus, right? <laughs> you've got this sense of Roots that other people don't have. Uh, at the Heath Harvest Festival, several years ago, we started setting up prayer booth. And I got a real immersion into what Roots looked like when I watched Jerry Crozier and Lori Crozier in prayer booth. Jerry, he, must, well, he might as well be the commissioner of Crawford County. Because the way that he was entreating people to come over to pray was like, Hey, Bob, you need prayer. I know you since high school. That's what Jerry was doing. But see, I got this thing that he understands roots. He's been here a very long time. How do people like Jerry or Darla ever leave a community? Bad stuff has to happen. Life-changing stuff has to happen. And you know what? That has to happen most of the time with all of us. In order to get up and to get what Grandma called the gumption... 
to pick up and go somewhere else and start all over again, there's got to be something happening. And this is what was happening in the church. There was persecution. And people were going, I don't want to stay here for that. I'd like my kids to have somewhat of a normal life. I'd like to be able to go and, and, and feel safe. And so they started going all over the world. And the coolest part of that is they used the roads that the Romans built for conquest. So the Romans would go into all these different places all over the world. They would build these roads to take their armies where they wanted them to go so that they would have solid supply lines. And what occurred? The gospel walked on the same roads as the soldiers did. And so God was in the business of transforming lives and people using this whole thing. But inadvertently, something that occurred as everybody started to scatter. Because again, you know, if you've been in a particular community a long time, you don't want to leave it, right? But maybe your kids did. And so a lot of times people would start to scatter, but they wouldn't be the older, mature, established people. They would be people who are like the younger people. And God bless younger people. I used to be one. Right? A little, a little more white? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I used to be one. And one of the things that I look back at, somebody recently asked me, actually it was for a term paper for school, why do you think that you would do better at this point in your life as compared to as a younger person? And I thought about that and I realized, man, you know, when I was young, I knew everything. Anybody feel what I'm talking about? Right? When I was young, I knew how to make a good argument for everything. I knew how to fight. I was strong. I was bold. And I was drop dead wrong in so many different things. And now that I'm on this side of, of almost in the midlife crisis, right, I'm looking back at things. And I'm realizing there's a lot of things I didn't know. There's a lot of life I needed to experience. There's a lot of life that I needed to see, a lot of humility that needed to come. It wasn't there when I was young. Now that I'm a little bit older, it's kind of grown on me, right? Anybody feeling what I'm talking about, right? A couple of you? So there's like three people telling the truth. Okay, anyways. So when the church went out, when it was scattered, I think we can presume that largely younger people took the message to all these different communities. But because they were younger people, because they didn't necessarily have the depth in the gospel as some of the older people, the stalwart, the, the pillars of the church would have had, there began to be some problems. There began to be churches where people, they were starting them, they were doing all the right things, and they were doing it all the wrong way. And so James gets word of this. What you need to know about James is that James is the brother of Jesus. James is one who has been in this from the very beginning. And I mean, can you imagine what James' life was like? Hi, I'm Jesus. I'm the Savior of the world. Shut up. <laughs> you know? I mean, think about it what things James would have had to overcome in order to fall in line with the message of Christ. But James did it. History says James actually became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Top dog. It's this guy who's writing all of these little splinters that are all over the world. And he's talking to them about their immaturity. If I could go a little further... The Bible teaches us something very provocative about the Christian life, and you've heard me say this before. The essence of the Christian life is selflessness. Selflessness. John the Baptist demonstrated this. You remember what John the Baptist said when Jesus came on the scene? He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Paul the Apostle wrote about selflessness in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said, for I am crucified with Christ. Yet not I live, but Christ who lives within me. Paul further taught in Philippians chapter 1, 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know what I want for my life? 
I want one, one, one day to have a really good night's sleep and to wake up the next morning and have it all figured out. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about, right? I want it all figured out. Now, I realize that that's probably not going to happen, that I'm not going to wake up one morning and all of a sudden getting it, but the beauty of that is that God sits up in heaven and goes, <laughs> that's right, but I'm committed to you getting it. And so he walks us on this journey called holiness where we find selflessness and we take on the nature of Christ. And taking on that nature is a direct result of the Holy Spirit who is using the Bible. Moments like this, your devotional life, your prayer life, he uses these moments to prompt us to say, I want more of Jesus. Sometimes those prompts, they come with a really heavy foot, you know? Someone says to me, well, Pastor, I wore my steel toe boots this morning because you were dancing all over my feet. Well, get saved, Jerry. No, I'm teasing, but, <laughs> you know. The idea here is sometimes those prompts, they're heavy. They hit us like, like a two-by-four across the chops. And we sit there and we go, what am I supposed to do with this? You're supposed to take it. Because God is not doing it to bring pain to your life. He is doing it for impact. He is doing it to be purposeful. And this is the context of James. But realize James is packing a punch this morning. He stops off in verse, or he starts off in verse one through four. To make it just simple here for these next moments, he's saying, hey, church, y'all acting selfishly. And you gotta cut it out. And I'm using this line break it off. We're th picture that bad relationship that you once had. Picture your mama sitting there going, uh-uh, no, 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 no. What does she want you to do? She wants you to break it off. She wants you to end pursuing something that ultimately is going to be destructive in your own life. Here is what James is saying. Y'all are doing it, but you're doing it wrong. So if you keep going this direction, it's going to be terribly destructive. But if you change, there's hope because of grace. He says you're fighting, you're coveting, you're praying with selfish motives. The actions, your actions, the what you're committing, it shows that you are not a friend of God. And here's the result, church. If you're not a friend of God, you're going to be going through the motions of your Christian faith. And those motions are going to be incredibly pointless, a pointless exercise because you're putting your agenda over God's desires in your life. Your worldview is not selflessness. Instead, it's all about me. And the people who are watching you, they'll see it. They'll see it. And God goes further in James, and he says, look, I'm looking at you. I'm watching what you're doing. You have a pointless Christianity at this point because you're not grasping hold of selflessness and turning your life over to me. He's saying, I will not give you what you pray for because you pray selfishly. He goes on to say, Make no mistake about your thoughts and actions. They are sinful. These thoughts and actions, if you were back at the home church with your mama, she would be sitting there saying to you, this is not who you should be. They were doing it wrong. And God is using James in this particular section of chapter four to say, you guys got to get your life in order. You got to break off all of the thinking that hinders you. Because if you don't break it off, if you continue to act this way, you deceive yourself and you are not God's friend. Let's go a little further. Verse 4, 6 through B, he says, you're deceiving yourself. Break it off. If we continue from verse 5, he says, if you want to be a friend of the world, don't think that you are my friend. 
And what's, be, what's it mean to be a friend of the world? You know, I grew up in a very rigid and strict environment. We didn't go to movies. We didn't listen to that rock and roll music. My father cornered me one day and he presented me with this preacher. I don't remember what his name was. I just knew he spit a lot. <laughs> and this guy stands behind the pulpit, smacking the pulpit, saying, you can't have Christian rock because you can't have Christian beer. Had some time processing that one. Here's what I know. If the world is going this direction, we're called to go this direction. Being a friend of the world says, well, I hear you, but I really like this direction. I could tell everybody about that one, but I really like this direction. It's compromising the integrity of what Jesus has done. It is saying there is a multitude of ways to get to heaven. It is saying that you don't have to submit your life to Christ. Being a friend of the world ultimately says, if I do enough, God will accept me. But that's not what the Bible says. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through your good works and actions. Does that sound right? The gift of God is eternal life through whom? Jesus Christ, the Lord. We all deserve death, except for the intervention of Christ. We receive grace for salvation. That grace gives us a heart transformation. We live in grace when we continue to have that heart transformation. We know God wants us to go this way. The world pulls us this direction. When we live in grace, we are saying, yes, at times I will fail. But I'm, my heart, my mind, my goals are that way, not that way. Without that transformation, you can do all the good things in the Bible and still go to hell. You hear what I just said? The text says that God is jealous about us. Isn't it awesome to realize God doesn't want to share? It's kind of different than we raised our kids, isn't it? But God goes, no, you're so important to me. I don't want you compromised in any way. I will not leave you alone on this journey. I am with you every single step. I am helping you along. But make no mistake about it. If you dig your heels in and you say to God, I am done moving, God will oppose you. Matthew 10, says, whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Some people might ask me, could that be the loss of your salvation? And I only ask you to consider the parable of the sower. Do you know how the story goes? He goes out to sow. He's throwing seed all over the place. Some seed falls on hard soil. You remember what it said happened to the birds came down and scooped it up. The purpose of the seed was lost. And I could tell you about the seed that fell on good soil, but I want to focus on those two other areas it fell. The ones that fell on soil that had rocks underneath it, and quickly the plant took off, but because the, the rocks were underneath it, the soil uh, prohibited the, the roots from running deep. And the plant, when it got too hot out, dried up and died. And then there was another set of seed that fell on another soil. It had weeds all around it. And the plant got in there and it took off, but the weeds ultimately choked it out. And I'm bringing that to you for this sake. You know, Jesus through James has just said, you need to know if you are a friend of God. He goes further to say, disown me, I'll disown you. And then we talked about, is this a loss of salvation? Let me ask you, is the picture of the seed dying because the roots couldn't run deep. A picture that par parallels sometimes what happens in new Christians' lives. It's the picture of the seed being choked out by the weeds, the cares of this world. A picture of what sometimes happens in new Christians' lives. If it is, let's be very clear. The seed can be consumed by the environment that is around it. 
So if you want to grow in Christ and you know he says you got to go this way, you can't keep going that way. And you can't stand here and go like this because doing that is not laying out to God that you are his friend. I ask you this morning, are we susceptible to the same outcome if we cohabit with sin? Are we going to see sin choke the life of God if we attempt to keep one foot in each world? James, he gives us stark warnings. He says, avoid the outcome. He says, I will give you more grace so that you can do it. He says, take your compromise with this world and break it off. And here's how you do it. And I'm going to hit this real quick. Five action steps. Submit, resist, draw near, wash, and purify. Submit, resist, draw near, wash, and purify. For time's sake, I'm going to make this short. Whoever heard growing up, my house, my rules, right? Y'all heard that, right? You don't get to come to God and dictate how you're going to do the Christian life. It's his house. It's his rules. And if you think you can, you have just positioned yourself to do this all the time, which means you're getting no benefit of your growing walk with God. To grow in God, you either have to walk this direction. Check that. To grow in God, you have to walk this direction. There's no going both ways about it. So the very first thing, if you're going to break off the immaturity of selfishness in your life, is you have to go to God and say, I'm done fighting you. It's your house. It's your rules. I'm listening. The second thing is that you have to resist. And resistance is not some sort of, well, it's, you know, whatever. Resistance is bold. That's why I showed this video in the beginning. Resistance is crazy bold. It's not simply taking life and being a counterpuncher. Resistance says, I'm not getting into this fight anymore. Resistance says, I have everything I need through the cross. I have every weapon that I need through the cross, and I am not bowing to Satan's plan in my life anymore. I'm not doing it. I am building the walls to say he gets no more authority in my life. Draw near to God. Can I tell you what drives me absolutely crazy at times? What drives me crazy is when the people of God don't understand how to move when the Spirit of God is moving. It drives me crazy because I want to be like, come on, if you just see this, you can get the full benefit of what God is doing. But too many people sit in their pews and go, I can't move, I can't do it, nope, nope, nope. I've watched people, grown men, white knuckle the pew in front of them, terrified that if they take eight steps and come to this altar, they're going to lose control. Look at what the scripture says. Draw near to God. If this is the spot where you see God is moving, why sit on your butt and stand right there? Why do it? Well, your sermon wasn't for me, preacher. Really? If the Spirit of God... Can, I don't have enough time. The, 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 <laughs> if the Spirit of God is moving and you see it, move. Move. What will God do if you come to the altar and the preacher doesn't pray for you? He'll still meet you. What if the sermon wasn't about what you came to the altar? He's big enough to deal with that. If you see God moving, get your hands out of your pockets, stand up, and move. Four, wash. Every day, what grandma say before you ate? Did you wash? No? Get going, right? Life and all the garbage of this world is going to make you unclean. How does that factor into your day by day? David wrote, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. Do you know the priests couldn't even go into the holy place unless they had been ceremonially washed? 
When we come to God, the very first thing that the people of God should do is, God, today I have blown it. But I accept all of what you have to make me clean. And finally, purify. The picture is what the priest actually had to do. They had to go through all of these different steps. But how it pertains to our life is like this. God understands that we will fail. He understands that we will make mistakes. He understands that we will mess up. He understands that that pull affects our human nature to go the direction opposite of the direction that he wants us to go. Here's what he does for us. He gives us power to say yes to God and no to sin. So this idea of purify your hearts is an idea of claiming hold of that power and saying, I do not need to go that direction anymore because I have seen the weight and what God has for me, and I'm not turning back. Remember the chorus? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Let me finish up. This can be overwhelming. You can look at this and go, whoa. What do we do with this? First know Paul wrote in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. All things. So if that Holy Spirit that shines the light of grace upon you moves in you this morning, understand, you might look at things and you might say, I've been doing this all my life, Aaron. God says, then I guess it's time. I guess it's time. I'll never be able to get rid of this habit. It's been generational for me, Aaron. Matthew 19, 26 says, With man all things are impossible, but with God all things are possible. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, quit shortchanging his work. Believe. Believe. But believe in what exactly? If I could sum it up this way. You were not saved to have divided intentions. And you will not receive the benefit of your salvation, which goes far beyond, I'm going to heaven. You will not receive the benefit of your salvation if you live compromised. And if you have any doubt, just go back to what the hymn writer said. He said, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. You might look at me this morning and go, but Aaron, the cost is too much. I, wanna, I want you to think about exactly what the Christian life actually costs. Look at it from the perspective of tithing for a moment. God says, I own it all. I just asked for 10% back from you. He could ask for everything, but he doesn't. Look at it in the terms of relationship. Based upon the story of Adam and Eve, God visited Adam and Eve in the cool of every day. He could have been there 24-7 looking over their shoulder. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? But he wasn't. He asked for a time, and he saw that that time was good. By surrendering your life to God, it doesn't mean you're in the church every time the doors are open. It means that you live for Jesus through Jesus and everything life has for you to do. He wants to be Lord of your life, not just a part of your life. And so making him Lord of your life is saying, Jesus, you are the funnel by which I pour everything in my life through. And if it runs contrary, if it comes to the bottom and it's unclean, I'm throwing it out. I'm breaking it off because I want better. I want something different. If you do that, you will see God. That's what the scripture says. Without holiness, no one could see God. So with holiness, what does it mean? You will see God. You will know a joy. You will experience God in a way that will not make your personal faith something that you go, what is the point? Christianity has a point. So let me encourage you this morning, make the choice that you need in how you live it. 
so that, trying to figure out the best way to sum this up. Pray to God daily that selfishness in you may die, that selflessness in Christ may live.